today's speaker is April Pruitt, and she's actually going to be talking about an animal that doesn't have that many bones or any and a lot of legs. And so she's going to be talking about the brain body connection of the octopus. Um, so with that, I'll hand it over to her. All right. So hello, everyone. Like Kartika said, my name is April Pruitt, and I'm a first year PhD student in neuroscience here at Yale. And today we're gonna take a deep dive into the brain body connection of the octopus. Uh, but first I wanted to tell you a little bit about my scientific journey. Um, I grew up in a rural town called Opelousas in St. Landry Parish in Louisiana. And I attended the University of Louisiana at Lafayette uh, where I studied biology. And it was here that I got really interested in research uh, and in neuroscience. And I did some really cool experiments uh, to study how the lack of molecules called growth factors impact motor function and movement. Um, so I'm gonna show you guys a little video. And in this video, you'll see a little mouse on a balance beam, there he is. Um, and he's walking towards some female bedding uh, because it smells really good to him. Um, and this mouse, he's got all of his growth factors, and although he stumbles a little bit, um, he's still able to walk to the end. Uh, so the next mouse that you'll see, um, this mouse is missing his growth factor receptors in his brain, and we see that he really can't walk on the balance beam. Um, he doesn't have good balance at all. Uh, and this mouse, he really just does uh, the booty scooty to the end of the balance beam uh, to get to uh, that female bedding. Um, so that's our, that's our knockout mouse. Um, and so I loved research. I loved doing experiments. I loved learning about the brain and thinking about what happens when things go wrong in the brain. Um, and I love this so much that I decided to go to graduate school. Uh, so here I am at Yale. Uh, I still really love the brain and I'm still really interested in how the brain works. Um, but I switched from motor dysfunction um, to autism and from mice to zebrafish. Uh, but today we're going to be talking about another aquatic creature who is super interesting. And all of you are going to think that this is the coolest animal ever by the end of this talk. That's right, I'm talking about the octopus. Um, and so probably we all know that the octopus has eight arms, um, but I have another question for you. How many brains does an octopus have? Um, feel free to put your guesses in the chat and we'll figure out this answer by the end of our time together. Oop. Okay. Um, so today we're gonna cover three major topics about the octopus and its fantastic nervous system. So first we're gonna talk about the evolution of the octopus and about and of its nervous system. Uh, then we're gonna move on to compare uh, the octopus nervous system to the vertebrate nervous system. And vertebrates are animals that do have a backbone. And then finally, we're gonna, we're gonna look at how scientists are using the octopus as a model organism. Um, and get prepared everyone, I will be saying octopuses quite often in this talk. It's a really funny word. Um, but it's gonna, it's gonna be great. Okay, so what you're looking at here is a phylogenetic tree um, or a family tree of the octopus. So octopuses are invertebrate animals, uh, meaning that they have no backbone and they reside in a large family group called mollusca or you might have heard it as mollusks. Um, and this includes many different types of animals. Um, from snails um, to and snails and slugs um, to clams and scallops um, to these funky looking uh, armored sea creatures called polyplecophora here at the bottom. And octopuses are members of this class called cephalopoda. And cephalopoda, they're also called cephalopods. Um, this means head foot. So cephalo means head and pod means foot. Um, so together, cephalopod is head foot. And we can see that with the octopus. We see that it has a big head. Um, it has many, many different little arms. Um, so the members of cephalopoda are, of course, 
the octopus, um, but it also includes the octopus's close cousins, um, which include the cuttlefish, uh, the squid, the nautilus, and the vampire squid, which is neither vampire nor squid. So let's discuss uh, some characteristics of the octopus. So first, they're really old. Um, so this is an evolutionary time scale uh, where the left is the oldest point in time here, uh, and the right is the most recent now, uh, which is the Cenozoic era. Um, so here we are now in the present, and this is when cephalopods first appeared uh, on the planet in the Upper Cambrian period, and that was 500 million years ago. Uh, and so there's two major subtypes of cephalopods. Uh, one is the octopus squid cuttlefish group, and the second is the nautilus group. And these diverged about 470 million years ago. So they've been around for a really long time. Uh, second, uh, there are different types of octopuses, but many are adapted to live at the floor of the ocean. So this is called the benthic lifestyle. Um, octopuses are regularly seen finding prey on the seafloor, and they've developed really diverse hunting strategies. Um, they inhabit caves and small spaces, and they can get away from predators by jetting away in the water column, um, but most are not actively swimming in the water column. They really just like hanging out on the seafloor. Next, octopuses are basically liquid animals. Uh, they have no shell, and because of this, Octopuses can squeeze into really tight spaces um, to escape from predators or to hide out and catch prey. So as long as the hole is large enough to fit their eyes, the octopus can squeeze in. Uh, does anyone have a hypothesis about how the octopus lost its shell? Uh, if you do, let me know in the chat. And uh, we're gonna discuss one theory uh, about the evolutionary history of how the octopus lost its shell. All right. So 500 million years ago, uh, a cephalopod ancestor that had a hard external shell uh, developed a way to use that shell for buoyancy uh, by filling its shell with gas to float above the seafloor. And this flotation gave it advantages over its neighbors that did live on the seafloor. Uh, through evolutionary time, the oceans diversified and more animals evolved and cephalopods got bigger. But they also encountered predators, uh, which were fast jawed fishes. Over time, other cephalopods, such as the ammonites, uh, developed ways to evade predators by living fast. They produced lots of offspring. Um, but they died young, and so they had many different sizes and shapes of their shells. Eventually, uh, a new lineage of coleoids, uh, which look like today's squid and octopus, uh, these coleoids evolved and they wrapped their soft mantles, their soft body parts, around their hard shells, and they kept them there permanently. So over millions of years, um, the shell in the coleoids shrink and it started to be made of lighter and lighter material. So these coleoids that look like our octopuses and squids of today, um, they had no protection, they had no shell, uh, but they evolved faster ways to move, um, such as jet propulsion, which we see octopuses and squids do today. Um, octopuses of today have little stylets, uh, which are, remnants of their internal shell. And so um, these coleoids, uh, they inhabited the deep, deep sea. Now, we've all heard of the asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs. This asteroid also changed the makeup of the ocean. So once the asteroid hit, the ocean became much more acidic. The pH of the ocean changed. And this acidity compromised the shells of the early cephalopods. So luckily, ancient coleoids were living in the deep sea and they weren't dependent on shells. Um, 
but their competition was eliminated by uh, this major this major asteroid. And so the coleoids were able to rise up and now they've colonized every marine ecosystem on the planet. And they play really important roles in food webs. They also use their intelligence, their agility, their speed, and their camouflage instead of their shells to outsmart predators and to catch prey. And we're gonna talk about uh, their camouflage a little bit more later on in the talk. So continuing on the octopus characteristics, um, octopuses are masters of mimicry. They're able to mimic their environment by using special cells called chromatophores and iridophores. And we'll dig a little bit deeper into that um, in, in a few slides. Another cool thing that octopuses can do is walk across the seafloor. So as you can see in this little gif, um, octopuses can use two of their arms to walk while holding up their mantle and their other arms. And finally, uh, as a little throwback to my previous exploring science talk on dreams, uh, which you can find on the Open Labs YouTube channel, and all of you should check it out, um, octopuses can dream too. And as they dream, uh, and they're probably dreaming about catching prey, uh, they can change colors as they would as if they were awake. So octopuses are pretty cool. Uh, and we're just going to keep digging on a little bit deeper. So now that we've spent some time on the evolution of the octopus and its characteristics, it's time to switch gears and talk a little bit more about the octopus nervous system itself. So I have a very important question for you all, and it's up here on the screen. Which do you think has more neurons, an octopus or a dog? Which do you think is smarter? Put your answers in the chat and we're gonna um, find out the answers to this question in a couple of slides. Okay, so the octopus nervous system is the largest and the most complex nervous system among invertebrates. So compared to its not so distant cousin, the snail on the right, um, which is also a mollusk, uh, the octopus has 500 million neurons compared to the snail's 20,000 neurons. Uh, the octopus's behavior and cognitive abilities uh, seem comparable with mammals rather than invertebrates. And you can see this uh, in this cute little gif of the octopus, which is using its cognitive abilities um, to twist the top of this jar and escape. So octopuses are really smart. Uh, so the octopus nervous system size falls within the vertebrate range and has a comparable number of neurons to a dog. The dog is only uh, beating out the octopus by 30 million neurons. So the dog has 530 million neurons and the octopus has 500 million neurons. But we see that octopuses have more neurons than these other vertebrates like your cat, um, a rat, a mouse, uh, which are all commonly used lab animals. Humans, on the other hand, have 86 billion neurons, which is much more than any of these other animals. But as we will see, um, the octopus nervous system allows it to carry out really complex tasks and respond to environmental stimuli um, very intelligently like a human does. So we know that humans have a complex nervous system, um, but do humans and octopuses share any of the same uh, nervous system structures? So one of the most similar structures that humans and octopuses share um, is the eye and retina. And the retina is the back part of the eye that has cells that detect light and color. Um, and so if we are comparing the human and the octopus eye structure, we see that they're extremely similar. Um, humans and octopuses both have camera eyes uh, and each of these tissues has like an eyelid, uh, a lens, uh, the retina, um, and the optic nerve or the optic ganglion. However, there are differences between these two eyes and the differences um, arise during the development of each eye. And so this is an example of convergent evolution. Um, convergent evolution is the process by which 
independently evolved features um, that are superficially similar to each other um, can arise through different developmental pathways. Uh, so we talked about uh, the octopus and human um, brain structures that are similar, but another question is, do humans and octopuses share brain functions? Um, and so the answer to that question is yes. So learning and memory um, appear in uh, appear to occur in all cephalopod um, lineages, so all of all of the octopus and its cousins. Um, and of course, learning and memory happens in humans as well. Um, in the octopus, um, long term memories are controlled by the vertical lobe, uh, which is in their central nervous system, um, while their short term memory is uh, more distributed throughout their, their nervous system, which is similar to, to vertebrates. Um, in humans, however, uh, we see that learning and memory is really happening in, uh, in the frontal and the temporal lobes. So movement or motor control in cephalopods um, takes place in the supraesophageal mass. And this is a really big word, um, but it's okay. We're gonna we're gonna look at it a little bit more in detail. Um, but the supraesophageal mass uh, really interprets gravity information, um, and it uh, it really controls the movement of the octopus. Now, in humans, uh, we see that movement is controlled by a lot of different areas, but one main area is uh, the primary motor cortex. Um, and so in octopuses, they feel different sensations, they have different sensory functions, and this information um, is located and interpreted in the frontal and the vertical lobes of their brain. Um, in humans, humans have what's called the thalamus, which is a relay center for all of this sensory information that's coming into the brain. Um, and so the thalamus and the frontal and vertical lobes aren't exactly the same, um, but they do very similar functions. Okay. So now that we have talked a little bit about the octopus nervous system, uh, we want to do a breakout activity. And for this breakout activity, you guys are gonna do um, a deep dive into the octopus nervous system with this 3D model. So your grad student volunteers will have a few structures for you to look at and figure out what they do. Um, happy exploring everyone, and I'll see you guys in about 10 minutes to recap. How did everyone like that breakout room activity? So let's do a little um, recap of the breakout room. Um, so the octopus nervous system structure um, I hope everyone was able to locate the eye, and we saw that the eye was um, a really large structure, um, and it's got like a weird looking pupil, it's like a rectangular pupil, uh, but the eye is used for um, seeing, just like, just like in human eyes. Um, then we have the optic nerves, which transmit those action potentials. Um, it helps to transmit the image from the eye to the, um, the central brain. Uh, then we have the optic lobe, um, and the optic lobe is responsible for processing those images. Um, we also have the vertical lobe, uh, which was here in the middle, the, the biggest part, and um, the vertical lobe is responsible for that long-term memory. Um, and we also have the frontal lobe, which works with the vertical, um, the vertical lobe, and it's involved in, in sensation and, and chemical sensation. Um, okay. And uh, the, the back view of the brain, we also had the supraesophageal mass, which was that, that large word that we talked about. Um, and the supraesophageal mass has a lot of different lobes in it. It also controls the chromatophores. It controls the muscles that, um, that control the chromatophores. And then here at the bottom, we have the subesophageal mass, another large word, um, but it, uh, it, it, it controls the, the movement centers. So that was super awesome. I hope you guys 
um, loved the, the breakout room activity. I know my group was uh, really getting a lot of the right answers, and so it was really interesting. Okay, uh, so the centralization of nervous systems, meaning having a, a brain in your head, it's occurred like five times during evolution. So that's just another example of that convergent evolution. But the octopus nervous system has um, three intercon interconnected specialized parts. Um, one is the central brain, uh, which is surrounded by cartilage um, and it integrates information. Um, it's got like 40 different lobes and they do a lot of different functions. Um, we also saw the retina which uh, has those cells that detect light and make images. Uh, next, we saw the optic lobes. And the optic lobes are those two large lobes uh, that were connected to, to the eye via the, the optic nerves. And um, each, of, each of these lobes has 60 million neurons. Uh, the central brain has 50 million neurons. So already we see that the optic lobes have more neurons than the central brain. Uh, and then finally, we have the peripheral or the body nervous system, uh, which includes the nerves that are in each arm and the octopus has eight arms. Uh, each of these arms has 40 million neurons. And this nervous system um, provides really independent regulation of the movement of, uh, of each arm. Uh, and so the peripheral or the body nervous system has more neurons combined than the central brain and the optic lobes. Um, and so like if you cut off uh, an octopus's arm, it's still able to respond to stimuli in the environment as if it were still attached to the octopus's body. So the question I asked at the beginning about how many brains does an octopus have well, it has one interconnected nervous system, but each arm can function independently. So if we think about it, they have the central brain plus each independent arm, so that's one plus eight. So they really almost have nine brains, which is pretty incredible. Um, another really interesting thing about the anatomy of the octopus is that the esophagus passes through the central brain. That is so insane. The central brain and the optic lobes are on top of and surround the esophagus. So that means that the, the octopus really has to digest its food into really small pieces um, so that no large chunks are going up into its brain. Just imagine if your esophagus, your throat, was actually going through your brain. That would be so crazy. Okay. So speaking of food and eating in esophagus, uh, we know that octopuses, um, they use their camouflage to often sneak up on prey or hide from predators. So we want to explore how the octopus camouflage actually works and if it's actually related to brain function. So camouflage begins uh, with a visual detection of edges, um, of contrast and the size of the nearby objects such as these coral, um, and then it, the processing happens in the central brain and the optic lobes. And so the processing helps the octopus to interpret information about its surroundings. Then uh, the muscles of the chromatophores, uh, which are these elastic sacs of color pigments that include blacks, browns, reds, oranges, and yellows, um, the chromatophores in the skin are controlled by some of those lobes of the central brain. Um, and this changes the color and the texture of the skin. Uh, so cephalopod skin is really composed of multiple layers. So the top part um, would be the epidermis, like the top part of your hand. Uh, and then right below that is the two layers of chromatophores. Um, so the chromatophores are closest to the top of the skin. Uh, below that is a layer of iridophores, which are cells that create reflective and iridescent effects. So this is inside um, of the octopus's body. Um, and below the iridophores are leucophores, uh, which are cells that reflect white and ambient light. 
Um, so the iridophores and the leucophores, uh, they produce all of the blues, greens, pinks, uh, and white colors. Um, and below the leucophores is the muscle. Um, so another thing that's really interesting um, is that octopuses use their visual input to stimulate the activation of the muscles that, um, that control the chromatophore. So they can produce different colors and textures, um, but octopuses lack color vision, so they don't actually know what color the environment is. This is why they're so cool. So octopus camouflage is just incredible. And I just wanted to show you guys some really cute GIFs um, so you can see it in person um, or virtually. But you can see this octopus was really like a dark brown or, or black color and it uses its camouflage um, and its eyes to detect the area around it and immediately change color and texture um, to almost perfectly blend in uh, with the substrate or the, the seafloor. And in this GIF, uh, I couldn't see the octopus at first, but bam, there it is. They are absolute masters of camouflage um, and they really use that to their advantage. Okay, so finally, uh, we're gonna talk about octopuses and research. So octopuses are actively used in a variety of research labs as a model organism. Um, to study a host of interesting topics. So uh, Gould Dolan's group at Johns Hopkins is using octopus to study uh, the evolutionary basis of social behaviors. So even though octopuses and humans are separated by about 540 million years of evolution um, and they have different brain anatomy, um, this, this research group is uh, looking at the genes, the entire genome, of the octopus to determine um, molecular building blocks for complex behaviors that are shared between octopuses um, and other, other animals. Um, the Geyer Lab at the University of Washington is studying a host of octopus questions. So they're looking at cognition, um, the neural basis of behavior, uh, they are looking at how octopuses take all the sensory information um, from its arms and integrate it into its brain. Um, and they're also looking at color perception because again, octopuses have no color vision. So it's, it's really insane. Um, and then finally, uh, the Crook Lab at San Francisco State University is looking at camouflage as well as neurophysiology and cognition. Um, and they're also really, really interested in injury and pain and how, um, how octopuses uh, react to, to pain and injury. Um, so that's all I have for you guys. And I hope that uh, now all of you are super excited about octopuses and you wanna be octopus biologists um, and I'll, I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks so much for such an amazing talk, April. Um, and I can tell you from the chat that um, they are excited about octopus. <laughs> I, I, that is clear. Um, so, um, oh, I have a question about where Shadow I'm at work. Sorry, Shadow's not here. But anyways, back to the questions for April. <laughs> um, so we had a lot of questions about the um, eyes of the octopus. And one question was, um, is the octopus eye made to be shielded from the water, unlike our eyes? Um, so are the octopus eyes shielded from the water? That's a good question. So octopuses have eyelids just like humans do. Um, so they, just like our eyes are exposed to air pretty much all the time, um, octopus eyes are also exposed to water pretty much all the time. Um, but they can close their eyes um, and, you know, they they open and close their eyes uh, to get dust out of the water. Like there are small particles in the water, um, but just like humans, they do have eyelids, and so their eyes are exposed to water all the time. But they can close them. Okay. Um, uh, another question that I've seen multiple times here now: If octopi are colorblind, how do they know which color to turn into? Yeah, that is a great question. 
and that is an active area of research. So um, the lab, the second lab that I mentioned is really interested in studying that um, because it's kind of unknown. Um, they can, like I said, they perceive all of the things in their environment um, and they have all these cells that are pigmented, um, but we really don't know how they're able to so quickly decide what color to change into. Um, so it's still a really active area of research. Um, but what I can say is that they do camouflage super well. They can change colors um, very, very rapidly. I think one estimate, they can change like 147 times in a minute. Um, so they're, they're pretty incredible. That's insane. I don't even know if I can think 147 things in a minute. Wow. <laughs> um, um, and speaking about camouflage, um, we had a question. Um, is the way octopuses camouflage similar to the way chameleons camouflage? Do you know? Hmm, that's a good question. I'm not as familiar with chameleon camouflage, um, but I would probably say chameleons also have special cells that are pigmented. Um, so although I'm not 100% sure, I think as far as like having cells that can change colors, they're pretty similar. And we were also talking about how it's kind of really impressive how they can change so many times in a minute. And we had a lot of questions about, is this related to how smart the octopi are? We've had questions about like, um, which one's smarter, an octopus or um, was it a monkey? Uh, yeah, so a monkey. Um, and if you also could tell us how much IQ does an octopus have? That was another question that we had in the chat. Those are really good questions. So. Um, I guess it really depends on how you define intelligence. Um, so octopuses are really well adapted for the environment they're, that they're in. Um, and they are really good predators. And um, they, they have really interesting ways of catching prey. So sometimes uh, they will like sneak up on, on a, a prey like a crab. And crabs have really hard shells, right? And octopuses have really liquid bodies. So they have to figure out a way to do all of this. Um, so they will basically like flare out their bodies um, to, to encapsulate the, um, the crab and then they'll like take it and kind of crush it um, to get to the meat. So that's like a very intelligent way of doing things. Um, monkeys are also very intelligent in their own right. Um, monkeys can be taught to use tools um, they can be trained to do a lot of different tasks. Um, there's like monkey researchers that are really looking into monkey intelligence. Um, so I don't know if I can directly compare um, how smart a monkey is to how smart a, an octopus is um, because they're both really intelligent in their own right. And they're both really well adapted for the environments that they live in. I mean, if you put a monkey underwater, I don't think it would survive well. And if you put an octopus on in the jungle, I don't think it would survive well either. So I think they're both equally smart. Um, and, and yeah, they're both equally smart. Another related question we had is, does the number of neurons that the octopus have um, make it more sensitive in any way? Does it make it more susceptible to feeling pain, for example? Yeah, so the octopus does have an extremely large amount of neurons. And um, I, I would say like the pain stuff is still a pretty active area of research, uh, but is it more susceptible to like feeling sensations? Yeah, it feels a lot of sensations. Um, it, each, each individual arm has like suckers, right? And all these suckers have um, they take in chemical information, they take in touch information, um, and all of this information is transmitted um, through their nerves um, into the central brain for, for integration. Um, so they're extremely sensitive animals. And they're also like, they have, I would say that they have some type of emotion. Um, and I only say this because there have been reports that, you know, octopuses can learn how to play. Um, and so octopuses are really solitary animals, meaning that they normally live by themselves. However, researchers have um, 
they've had octopuses in like a tank and they have um, like a little pill bottle that they put in the tank and the octopuses will play with the pill bottle. Uh, they have like uh, streams of water that will bring it closer and the octopus will like swat it away or come back to it. And so they're capable of these really complex behaviors um, and we don't even know why they would need that. Why would an octopus need to evolve play? Like, why would it need to have emotion if it's living alone? We have no idea. Um, and so, yeah, that's another really interesting question, another really active area of research. Okay, so we have time for one last question, and this has been a debate the entire talk. Is the correct way to say the plural of octopus, octopi? Or octopuses. Yes. Okay. I was actually just having this conversation with my lab mates. So the word octopus um, is a Greek word. It comes from the Greek word octopus that's spelled with a K. And so Greek words, when you make the plural of Greek words, um, you use uh, like S or ES. Um, whereas for words that are rooted in Latin, you use the I. Um, so octopuses is the correct is the grammatically correct way to, to uh, as the plural form because it's a Greek word. However, um, you can also call them octopods. That's acceptable. Um, octopi is really common. Uh, I don't think anyone's gonna, you know, have a big fit if you say octopi, um, but grammatically it's octopuses. And there's your official answer. It is octopuses. <laughs> <laughs> okay, once again, thank you so very much, April, for such an amazing talk. Um, and I'll pass it over to um, the closing speaker now.